All right. Hello, everybody, and welcome once again to another episode of the Remarkable Coach Podcast. As always, I am your host, Michael Pacheco, and today with me, I have Thomas Jelmy. Uh, Thomas is based in Switzerland with a global reach. Uh, he stands for measurably more impact in leadership and collaboration by developing human aspects. Thomas works with executives and leaders worldwide across cultures and industries. Um, Thomas, man, thanks for making time for, for, for the podcast. I appreciate you showing up and having a chat with me today. It's my pleasure to be here. Thanks for uh, inviting me and for having me here as your guest. Yeah, Wonderful. you bet. Uh, one thing that is probably worth mentioning is this is technically your second time on the podcast. I think you yeah. were maybe episode number two back when Doug Holt was, uh, was hosting the show. Yeah, yeah, that that was uh, like I don't know, three, two, three years ago, give or take. Probably that, that sounds yeah. about right. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So for those uh, for for our viewers and listeners who have not seen that first episode, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself uh, in your own words and kind of what's you know maybe what's new and what you've been up to in the past two to three years? Okay, yeah, I'd love to. Well, I'm. Um... I'm 55 years old in July. I refer to it as level 52. So I made all the previous levels. And it's about, yeah, a bit more than 20 years now that I've been active in the domain of learning and development, mostly working with leaders in organizations, various levels, and helping them to develop human aspects in leadership and collaboration um, and also customer uh, customer relationships. I do this with a lot of pleasure and passion because there's a lot of work to do. And uh, before those 20 years that I have been doing this, I've had a quite colorful part of my first part of my biography. I spent uh, one and a half years uh, working for a circus, touring around, living in a trailer. I've spent uh, almost eight years leading cabin crew for Swiss Air, the former Swiss International Airline. So I traveled a lot, learned a lot about people and what works and what doesn't work in when people start to interact. Uh, I earned my first money cutting people's hair. Uh, I did an apprenticeship three years <laughs> as a hairstylist. And what looks like kind of a zigzag biography in retrospect is a very clear threat through mm -hmm. all of all of it. Uh, and it, it began when I uh, was having conversations with people while cutting their hair. Mm -hmm. So I was already listening and, and, and having very partially verse, partially very personal conversations, uh, sometimes about things you I would have preferred not knowing, but <laughs> that was that was when it all began. And I was always, you know, having conversations with people. And the more I advanced in my career, the more structured, the more um, goal-oriented and the more effective mm -hmm. these conversations have, uh, have become, of course. I imagine and the more, more intentional the conversations became as well. Yes, yes, yes. And, and with more, a more intentional is, is a very good, uh, good one. And, and more, also with more, um, with a broader um, toolbox. Uh -huh. uh, with a broader repertoire of tools I can use, you know, for it's like if you don't, if you only have a hammer, of course, everything you do looks like a nail, right? Uh -huh. <laughs> but if you have a if you have a, a a variable toolbox, you can you can work very very subtly and very uh, specifically with people. So that's that's me, right? I work in four languages because I'm half Italian and half Austrian, and I grew up in Switzerland, so I uh, speak German, English, French, and Italian. Nice. Nice. I love it. Um, who, who are your clients? Tell us about your clients. Across industries and across cultures, because my special focus is not an industry focus, but uh, human beings, right? So the principles are the same regardless of the industry. Mm -hmm. um, and so... My clients are from various industries. They are mostly people in leading positions, mm -hmm. can be top executives, can be managing directors, can be middle management, 
positions can be team leaders or can even be people who just got promoted mm -hmm. into their first leading position and have no clue what to do. Mm -hmm. So this is about the range uh, I cover in various, uh, with various methods and, and, and approaches. Yeah. I love it. I love it. And where do you, where do you get your clients these days? Actually, first, like, before we go there, where, where are your clients these days? I know you, you live in Zurich still, I believe. Yes. Are you, yes. Are you working in North America more now, or are you in, mm. in Europe? You're all over. Mm. Well, I have clients all over. I have clients in Asia. I have clients in North America. I have clients in Europe. Mm -hmm. At the moment, huh? at the moment, it can vary. I've been, I, I did some work in Africa. I did some work in Australia too, but currently that's about the, 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 the range. And um, most of my clients are here in my area, let's say Central Europe. Sure. And um, maybe to add right here, what has changed over the past three years since that pandemic hit the main change was how mobile i have to be to serve my clients how much i need to travel and this has gone from a lot to almost nothing yeah <laughs> so i've really over the past uh let's say the, the, the 15 to 17 years before the pandemic i traveled a lot to yeah. all those countries I just mentioned or the regions in the world I just mentioned uh, because that was what we did, right? In my, in my industry, that's what a trainer or a facilitator or a coach would do. Yeah. And then bomb down to, to, to zero. And what I did very quickly at the very beginning of this pandemic, uh, once it became clear that this is not going to pass within two, three months, this is probably here to stay for a while, probably for longer than we would wish to, which wish for is that I, I, I virtualized my business mm -hmm. and I approached my clients actively. I said, Hey, let's virtualize. Yeah. Trust me, this works. Yeah. And some were more skeptic, uh, skeptical than others, but in general, oh, everybody said, yeah, okay, let's try. And it went very, very well. And today, most of my work, is still virtual and yeah. it, it, it works very, very well. Of course, yeah. now I'm seeing people more often in person as well. Of course, here in my area, mostly, but it's still uh, the, mon the minority, right? Yeah. It's the, the biggest, the bigger part is still uh, virtual. Yeah. yeah, I remember, I remember when you were making that shift in, I want to mm. say it was, you know, summer, summer of 2020. Around yes. COVID time because you had you had hired us to to work with you on on branding yeah. and messaging, and right. and and there was how how were you how certain were you that virtual work the virtual work that you were doing specifically was going to work as well as it does as well as it did at the time? Mm, I was very certain, yeah. and the reason why was because already back in twenty. 10, 2012, I was running uh, development programs for a, a, a big multinational organization, which is still a customer of mine. And those programs had various elements. They consisted of on-site workshops for which I had to travel to places, right? But they also had virtual elements. They had uh, a virtual kickoff meeting, for example. Mm -hmm. And then they had, after we first met in person for a few days, they had a virtual midterm session where we exchanged progress mm -hmm. with the participants. And then they had a second on-site part and then a, a, a virtual closing call. So already 10 years ago, I I did some virtual work. We used to uh, use... Um, Microsoft Live Meeting, I think it was called at that time, and, and then, then Skype, you know, and, and those, uh, those kind of tools. Um, and it worked very well. So that's where I took the confidence from, that uh -huh. this can be done, and it can be done very well. You just, you got to know how to do it. You got to know the, 
the specificalities, if that's a word, of, of working virtually as opposed to working in person. There are some differences that you just have to be aware of and then, uh, and then deal with. And then it works really, really well. And I would, I, I, it's, it's interesting. Of course, now, like, everybody does it and everybody knows that it works. I would just, I, I, I'm imagining at the time there must have been if not for you, for your clients, some trepidation in going into that, mm. given mm. given the nature of your work, so human focused, yeah. interpersonal relationship focused, how are you going to do that for me and my team, right? Yeah. Through a computer screen. Yes, yes, and yes, of course. As I mentioned, some were very skeptical. Others said, "Yeah, let's give it a try," and and, and others said, "Yeah, of course, we're going to do that." So. Yeah. Um, yes, of course, it has become part of the new normal. And still, after three years even, some are still uh, in, a, in, a, in a mindset or in an attitude that says, no, 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 no it's, it's just not the same and it's not going to work the same way. And, you know, my experience shows now that it is very much a question of mindset and huh? attitude, how you, how you approach virtual Co collaboration. If, of course, you believe that it's not going to work the same way and it's never, it can never be the same as meeting a person in a room and sitting together across a table, then, of course, it won't yeah. be the same. Of course. And it isn't the same, but it, it won't have the same quality because you, it's like a self fulfilling prophecy, right? Sure. As opposed to believing that. It can really, to a large extent, replace a physical meeting in a room. Yeah. It's just different. It has different characteristics that you have to be aware of. And then it can really replace a face-to-face -face physical on-site interaction very well. And I have a depth in my coaching conversations that I have with clients in the US, in Asia, in other parts of the world, virtually that are absolutely comparable to having a conversation physically in a room. Yeah, yeah. And of course it helps if, if you can meet in person, for example, mm -hmm. uh, to start a process, that helps. Or you can, at the very beginning, have a, a, a yeah, a, a personal meeting, a personal interaction, that helps, yes, but it's not a showstopper if you can't, sure. right? Yeah. yeah. Webcams have to be on all the time. That's, yeah. that's, that is a, a showstopper. If I still sometimes <laughs> hear people saying things like, yeah, I don't believe in webcams. I don't switch it on, yeah? Okay. <laughs> well, yeah, interesting, yeah, interesting. What's and, the... And, do you, do you know what the what's 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 the process behind that that thought behind that opinion? Well, there's uh, one thing could be can be a, a sense of or a feeling of unease, right? Sure. Because you're on camera. Yeah. Uh, but in many many cases, I'm I'm convinced that there's an official reason and then there's a real reason. And the real reason is very often if I have the camera shut down. I can do other stuff on the side because it's very tempting because it's all there because I'm sitting at my desk anyway. So yeah. Outlook <laughs> is up and uh, Teams chat, live chat is up and I ha have all the communication windows open mm -hmm. and communication channels yeah. open. And you've got uh, this. So that, yeah, yeah. So that I can multitask, yeah. which is a, an absolute uh, uh, productivity killer, sure. as we know by now. Right. Yeah. Focus. Focus is what drives uh, uh, efficiency and productivity. But anyway, uh, holding a virtual session with 10 people with no webcams is like blind flight through mm -hmm. dense fog with no visibility and no instruments <laughs> to replace uh, the lack of visibility. So these are some, yeah, some, some details, some aspects of that. Interesting. Nice. So where do you, mm -hmm. where do you find your clients and how do you market yourself these days? Well, how I find my clients hasn't changed over the years. Mm -hmm. It has stayed the same and it has even 
improved or it has become more. And that's this one main channel and that's rate based on recommendation. Yeah, referral. So, yeah, referral. Nine out of 10 new projects I gain on based on recommendation, referral. People who approach me saying, hey, I, I had a conversation with such and such and he or she said, I'd probably probably be a good idea to, to connect with you and, and talk to you. Mm -hmm. That's how it works. Now, of course, this doesn't come from nothing and it doesn't just come out of the blue, right? Mm -hmm. There's ways in which um, you can stimulate that, mm -hmm. right? You can, you can, first of all, you got to do a good job, of course right? <laughs> You're, the, the work you do has to create value for your customers. If you don't do that, right, it, there's no basis for a referral, of course. of course. So that's the first thing. But then what many do is they hope to be at some point recommended mm -hmm. because they're doing a good job. And that this, the, the, the good work speaks for itself. Mm -hmm. Well, of course, it's a basis, but hope is not a, is not a strategy. Hope is not a strategy, yeah. <laughs> Hope is not a strategy. A more strategic approach to that is to ask for referrals, ask for active promotion. So what I, what I do, for example, is when I have a happy client, a, a, a happy customer throughout the project or latest at the end of a project, I would ask this one uh, question, and that is, Michael, who in your network might have an interest in talking to me? Mm. Who, who are maybe like two names that pop up in, in your mind um, of people that you would think they could have an interest in talking to me? Yeah. Because it would help them and, and serve them well. Mm -hmm. And usually people are willing to help. You know, if, if you ask them such a simple favor. Yeah. Some, some immediately come up with names. Some say, yeah, let me think about it and get back to you uh, with that. And then uh, be introduced, right? I like, the way so, that you're, I like the way that you're framing that as well. You know, mm -hmm. two, two names that you said, two, two names that pop up in your mind that, that would help them, that would serve them, right? It's not about yes. how much gel me. It's about helping the other yes. people in their network. Yes, yes, of course. Because that's my main driver. Right. My main, my, and, and of course, this is very personal. My main driver is not to successfully run a business and to grow the business and make more money and scale it up and whatever. Mm -hmm. My main focus is to help people mm -hmm. and support them in getting from, from good to great. In, mm -hmm. in, in becoming more effective in what they do, in becoming more effective leaders with less effort, you know, yeah. and less pain and friction and conflict. That's my main driver. Mm -hmm. that, I, that I need to make some money uh, doing that for a living, I think it's, it's a no brainer. Sure. Um, but that's like a side effect. And, and that's also the reason why I frame it like that. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 And and so that's one one thing, asking for referral. Another one is asking for testimonials that you can use on LinkedIn, then for example, or on a website, right? For example, that is proof uh, for for your competence and for your work. Yeah. And, uh, and the third element is visibility in social media. In my case, it's mostly LinkedIn mm -hmm. because I, am, I have a strong focus on the B2B, um, on B2B um, market. Mm -hmm. So it's organizations, it's companies, it's my clients are, are, are companies, not individuals. Or if they are individually approaching me, they are approaching me in the context of their role in an organization, but not as a private person. So that's why it's mostly LinkedIn. And there I try to just keep my visibility up so that I may be on people's minds whenever they have an opportunity. Be on their radar. Uh, or, or, or a need coming up. And that works uh, quite well. So I keep having 
I keep having uh, people connecting with me or contacting me saying, hey, we have a situation coming up. We need to develop something or, or, or uh, we need to professionalize our leadership, for example, in our organization. And we were discussing who we could work with and you were the first name popping up in my mind. So, yeah. of course, that's, that's, um, that's, that's, but that's about it. That's yeah. about the, the, the amount or level of, of marketing, if you like, that I am, that I'm doing. It's not yeah. much more than that. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about, let's talk a little bit about LinkedIn and what, what are you doing on LinkedIn? So I, it mm -hmm. sounds like, you know, what we call it content marketing, right? You're, you're creating content providing value up front so that as you said when someone thinks about you know we need uh we need we need a coach or some guidance for this you know who can we talk about you're the first person that pops into into mind what what sort of things are you doing on linkedin in order to stay on people's radar in order to continue to pop up in people's uh linkedin feed so as opposed to what you just said uh, I'm not posting a much uh, or a lot of self-created content. Okay. What I do is I curate content. Yep. Okay. I, I, and then I post um, third-party content. Content. Gotcha. gotcha. So I, I'm not wow. I'm not putting myself out there all the time saying, "Hey, look how great I am and what I do," and and you should work with me. Because honestly, for me, if I see something like that, it's more of a turnoff mm -hmm. than uh, than you know inspiring me to to connect with someone or work with or wanting to work with someone. For sure. Agreed. So I'm not trying to put myself in the center of the spotlight all the time, but I I want to provide value mm -hmm. by posting articles, content, blogs. Um, that I deem relevant for my clientele, mm -hmm. my, my target group, so to speak. And there are various sources. Uh, Harvard Business, Business Review is one. Forbes is one where I publish as well sure. myself. But, but uh, there's a lot of good content uh, on, various, on various channels that I post. Sure. That's it. Yeah. That's it. I like it. And I keep getting good feedback. I keep uh, getting, you know, people telling me, hey, uh, I, I love the value you create by these articles. Uh, I'm always interested and I'm, I'm following. So nice. that's it. And every now and then, of course, there's an article that I wrote yeah. that I also post, of course. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it happens. <laughs> I remember. <laughs> <laughs> you do that so, one article you remember <laughs> <laughs> so thomas you're you're all about the human factor right human to human mm -hmm. human interpersonal development think human act human be human talk yeah. to us a little bit about your 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 coaching specifically yes tell us, tell us about yes. what what you do mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> okay so what i do is support people in their development with a focus on these topics that you just mentioned. So human factors, human aspects in leadership and collaboration, some of which are, for example, emotional intelligence, uh, empathy, um, self-awareness, the ability to influence in an ethical way, mm -hmm as opposed to manipulating, mm -hmm. the ability to communicate clearly and effectively, the ability to navigate and resolve conflict mm -hmm. effectively so that the positive aspects that conflict can have are predominantly you know, resulting from how you, you're dealing with the conflict and with that as least, as little collateral damage as possible. So all of these um, aspects that are sometimes referred to as soft skills, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which I personally don't like as an expression okay. because how it's often used or referred to is as if the heart 
facts, the KPIs and the numbers and the facts and figures are what really counts. Uh -huh. And then there's the soft skills. Yeah, we also cover that. We, we, need, to, we need to organize a course sometimes later this year, maybe, so that we also cover the soft skills. You see what I mean? You see where I'm, where I'm going? Secondary. Yeah. Yeah. As if they were secondary. Right. Which they are not. Which they are not. They are, in fact, primary. And they are essential. Say? Yeah. They are essential. And that's why I call them essential skills. I love that. I love that. Because, I think, yeah. That, that's, that's so important. So at, at, at Boxer, whenever I'm hiring, we're hiring right now. And, and I always look for essential skills. Uh, yes. Because because hard skills can be taught, man. Hard skills are very easy to teach. It's very easy yeah. to teach someone how to use a tool, um, yeah. how to do something, how to follow a procedure, how to do something logically. It's it's much more difficult, in my experience, to develop essential skills in, in marketing. It's empathy. It's all about empathy. If you can't put yourself in someone else's shoes, of it's, course. you're worthless in marketing. <laughs> and it's not just true for marketing. Yeah. It's the same in leadership, in yeah. collaboration, wherever, wherever you put a bunch of people together and you want them to achieve something together, it's relevant. Even yeah. in a family, same thing, right? Yeah. So these skills, these human factors are the game changer when you focus on them, give them room, develop them. And they are the showstopper if you don't. <clears throat> they can very quickly become the showstopper. In, a, in such a way that um, if you neglect those aspects, people will eventually, in the worst case, mm -hmm. only do the bare minimum mm -hmm. that they are paid for mm -hmm. and work the hours that they are paid for and do what they're told, but not an inch more. Yeah. Uh, not even talking of extra miles, you know? Mm -hmm. And in the worst case, they become quiet quitters, mm -hmm. right? because they don't have this sense of belonging and the sense of being valued, appreciated, heard, and that their opinion counts. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, that's the case in many organizations. Mm -hmm. Why? Because even though most of the things we're discussing could be called common sense, right? Mm -hmm. It's common sense. Mm -hmm. Even though it's common sense, it's not so common right. in many organizations. Why? Because there's such a strong focus on profitability, mm -hmm. on KPIs, key performance <laughs> indicators, on numbers, on goal achievement, et cetera, et cetera, that the pressure is so high on leaders, on managers, mm -hmm. that they just forward this pressure into the organization and that because of that these common sense aspects essential common sense aspects fall by the wayside yeah and it is they don't they're not common practice right? yeah that's the reason why and for many managers it's a it's really a change of paradigm it's a, it's a mindset shift that is necessary and one of my clients uh, a while ago nailed it in one sentence at the end of a 12-month coaching process. He said, the most important thing I became aware of and I learned in this process is that you can positively change and influence the financial numbers of the organization by focusing on and caring for the people mm -hmm. and not the numbers so mm -hmm. much mm -hmm. you see and that to me i went hallelujah <laughs> that's it you got it uh -huh. <laughs> you got it and and it's the bit it i just realized it's a bit like what i just said a moment ago about my own business yeah what's the driver the driver is not uh focusing on the numbers and increasing revenue and uh, lowering costs and stuff the focus is on caring for people yeah. and being human and helping them connect with their humanity. Yeah. Uh, and then, and then the numbers are a side effect of that. It's, it's, it's the same also in, in, in this context. Yeah. And I do that 
by first of all raising awareness yeah. in my coaching conversations in my leadership development programs i also offer uh, that are more comprehensive um awareness is first always yeah and then once the awareness is is there options okay how can i do something different or differently from yeah. how i i'm used to doing it and then it takes concrete action baby steps, fine tuning here and there, trying out things, observing how it works. What's the effect? If I, for example, as a leader, for once I try to be the last to speak and add my two cents in a meeting, as opposed to always being the first person to speak. Yeah. Yeah. Small but significant change in many, in many cases. So that's, that's how it works. Yeah. That's, how, that's what I do. I'm yeah. curious yeah. to know, Thomas, how have you seen... Let me rephrase this. I want to choose my words carefully. Has there been a, a, a paradigm shift in leadership, specifically in corporate leadership over the past decade, two decades, and in, 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 in the way that I would imagine, you know, today it, it is probably not as difficult to convince someone holding the purse strings that this kind of coaching can have an impact on the bottom line. Whereas a decade ago, 20 years ago, 15 years ago, people really, you know, this, this kind of, <clears throat> this kind of focus on, on empathy and these essential skills were not, they didn't have the spotlight yeah. a decade ago, 20 years ago that they have today. So yes. in, in terms of, I mean, let's call it a sales conversation. How do you make, mm. how do you make that sale? And has there been a paradigm shift over the past decade or two? And mm. on top of that, I'm, I'm, I know this is, this is a multi-part question. Um, what does this look like in Europe compared to North America? Because I imagine there's a, there's a big difference there as well. Uh, uh, okay. Okay. So uh, first short answer to the question, has there been a paradigm shift over the past 10 to 15 years? Yes. Yeah, there has been and it's still happening. Of course, yes, there is increased awareness for that. There is a trend towards more um, people focus, people orientation, and all of these aspects that we just uh, that we're currently speaking about. Yes. And at the same time, we're not we're not quite there yet. Who's There's leaders? a lot. Hmm? Who's leading that charge in that paradigm shift? Is it is it authors writing more books about it? Is there something in in just the cultural zeitgeist that's just going that direction? It, it, can you attribute that? that it's shift? multiple aspects. Yeah. It's, mul it's multiple aspects. It's um, trends in society in general. Uh -huh. Yeah, more awareness for uh, and and public discourse also and discussion about topics like burnout. Uh -huh. yeah. mindfulness and, and all kinds of topics so that the, there is more of a, a presence of these topics in the, in the public uh, discussion that's one thing another thing um, is driven actually by by the numbers mm -hmm. by profitability issues by lack of employee loyalty mm -hmm. by lack of employee engagement by uh, difficulties finding and binding the right people in the labor market mm -hmm. these are very concrete challenges that organizations are are facing at least here in uh, in, in uh, central europe mm -hmm. that's very very prominent high up on the agenda and so driven through demographic change uh, for, for on, on the one hand side and also driven by the effects of the pandemic still, right? Uh -huh. okay. where, where, where people started to, for example, appreciate more autonomy and more freedom um, in, in, in a home office setting or in a hybrid, hybrid uh, work setting. So some organizations recognize that and value that and and also serve these needs 
by on the one end of the spectrum saying you're free to work when and where you like as long as you achieve the goals and produce the outcome that is required mm -hmm. or that we expect from you. And on the other far end of the spectrum, organizations that uh, are very strict by saying you have to be three days at the office per week and two days you can work at home um, or any you know, such strict regulations. Um, so yeah, there's multiple drivers and reasons that have caused and are still causing this mindset. But at the same time, there's still a lot of work to do. Yeah. There's still a lot. There are still, you know, managers uh, out there who say, uh, stay, stay away with coaching. Let's, uh, we need to achieve goals, uh -huh. right? Uh -huh. Yeah. Uh, coaching, coaching as a leadership uh, method. Um, sorry, that's, that's nothing for me. Um, uh -huh. We got to be directive. We got to be clear. We got to achieve goals here. Uh -huh. We have no time for such, you know, fluffy things. Yeah, interesting. You see what I mean? Yeah, yeah. it's interesting. No, I do. And then I, some, uh, yeah, and and some say, of course, I coach my people. When in fact, all they do is tell people what to do, and they just call it coaching. You yeah. know, but that's a, on a side note. <laughs> I think, I mean, that's kind of, for me, I think that's kind of the delineation between a coach and a consultant, right? A coach is, is mm -hmm. almost a guy that asks a lot of questions and the consultant is the one that comes in with the hard numbers and says, this is what you need to do. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's a good distinction. A little that's bit. a good distinction. And, and I would like to just come back to this one part of your question where you asked, Please. how am I having such a sales conversation? Yeah. 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 And you're probably thinking of a sales conversation where there's some resistance <laughs> on the other side, right? That's probably what you're thinking about. Well, be with or the idea, a lack of openness. Hmm? Yeah, a yeah, yeah. lack of openness to the idea of of having yes. these conversations and hiring yes. for fluffy conversations. Yes, exactly. <laughs> and and your question is, how am I uh, having such a sales conversation? And my short answer to that is, I'm not. Yeah, I'm not. Yeah. I, 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 you know, I don't, I don't want to convince people. I don't want to have to convince people of something they don't believe in. Uh -huh. If there's not a minimum of willingness and openness uh -huh. to at least look at something that might work, even if it's different from how we used to do things, uh -huh. I, that, I'm, I'm the wrong person. Yeah, I'm the wrong person. I want to work with people who want to do things differently, who have a willingness and an openness to change and growth and development, and are openly uh, are open to embrace, you know, my uh, what, what I have to offer and the approaches I, I promote. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, I'm I'm imagining you know the old school business leader, the old school Peter Drucker style, you know, KPIs, OKRs focused on spreadsheets mm -hmm. is going to be that that would be a, just a difficult conversation to come in and say, yes. hey, wanna, I want to talk, I want to talk to your to your managers about empathy. And yeah. They're going to they're going to look yeah. at you like, who the hell is this guy? <laughs> yes. And, and you know, I'm not saying the traditional approaches to management and leadership are wrong or they're completely outdated sure. they still they still have they they are still legitimate and uh -huh. still have their value and can be very effective in certain situations and contexts yeah mainly depending on the level of complexity of an of an, a nature of a task or a context or a challenge that presents itself yeah and that's, they have to be yeah. they have to be expanded uh, or the the, the 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 repertoire of a leader today has to be yeah. broader than that it has to be enriched by more agile approaches in sure. leadership by more uh, saying yes to the mess and being able to deal with uncertainty and complexity and trust Trusting people, yeah. trusting people that they can and want to do the job. Um, and so that's, that's what, what we're talking about. It's not about 
replacing something that's outdated and wrong. It's yep. about enriching it and broadening the repertoire and the toolbox. No, I think I think that's the key word there. You put a lot of emphasis on the word and. It's an it's an yeah. and also conversation. It's not an either or conversation, right? Exactly. Yeah. That's exactly true. And yeah. so, yeah, this openness is growing and um, it all comes down maybe as the last uh, or third aspect that has and keeps driving this mindset. It often also comes down, of course, to the individual leader, the individual mm -hmm. manager. Mm -hmm. Is this a person who is open mm -hmm. to personally also grow and develop and stretch into maybe something that's a bit uncomfortable at first because it doesn't come naturally, like showing more empathy, for example, yeah. or is it just like, nah, I'm not going to go there. Right. Yeah. So that's why the more, the, the longer I am in this, in this, in this business, in this industry, the more I see that leadership development in the end of the day is personality development nothing more nothing less mm -hmm. because all everything depends on that yeah. everything you do everything you say how you show up in a conversation how you react to somebody who just made a mistake or whatever all depends on where you stand in your own personality development yeah yeah, yeah this is great thomas um I, I, we could probably keep going for hours. Um, I always, you know, we, we've worked together. I love having these chats yeah. with you. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I would love to have you back uh, on the podcast at some point in the future to talk about how. Sure. I'd yeah. love to talk about your how. Um, and I'm sure that's probably not uh, a simple or short conversation either. Um, but I know, uh, I know firsthand how important uh, the essential skills are, not the soft skills, the essential ones. Um, and I would love to, to get into it a little bit about how you develop those. So is there for, for today, I know we're coming up on the hour. I want to be respectful of your yeah. time. Is there anything that we did not, uh, chat about that you would like to have an opportunity to talk about? I think we covered a lot <laughs> in the time we had, <laughs> uh, there was a lot of, uh, a lot of information. I'm aware of that. Maybe this is the last thing, um, uh, People can visit my website. It's it's completely brand new, up since just a few weeks. And um, it very nicely describes some of the aspects that we just spoken about. And uh, please connect with me on LinkedIn, for example, and, uh, and look me up. That's it. Awesome. And your website is jelmi.coach. That's G-E-L-M-I dot coach. Um, on LinkedIn, it's Thomas Jelmy, um, yeah, exactly. and we'll have, you know, for those of you who are maybe listening to this podcast on the go, we'll have links to that stuff, of course, on the on the show notes. Um, on Boxer Agency is our website. So, Thomas, man, thank you again. It's it's been great catching up with you. Um, mm -hmm. Always a pleasure to to chat with you, and thank you so much for making time. Thanks for having me as a guest. Pleasure talking to you. And thank you to our viewers and listeners, of course. Uh, this, this podcast doesn't mean anything about you guys, so appreciate you tuning in, and we'll see you next time. Take care.